Hi guys, this is Charles and I'm one of the surgeons at South Paws. I'm trying a new um, uh, format today, which is a webinar using a live camera stream and then also a PowerPoint presentation uh, just for um, a little bit of interest and to shake things up a little bit. And so I'm interested in what you guys think of the format and hopefully it'll, it'll run smoothly for you. So uh, I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint presentation in just a minute. And remember that the live chat is running. Um, at the same time. And so if you have any questions or comments, you can bring them up. Um, I'm running the live chat on my phone. And so um, I'm going to looking down at my phone as well as looking at the screen and the, the mixing board and stuff. And so it might be a little bit clunky, but hopefully it'll be interesting for you. So I'm switching over to the PowerPoint presentation now, and you should be able to see me up in the upper um, right-hand corner of the screen. So anyway, just confirm, please, that you guys can hear me by commenting on the live chat. Um, I'm using a different microphone um, instead of the one that I use in surgery. So on the screen here, we can see an incisional gastropexy that's been done in a dog prophylactically uh, to try to prevent um, gastric dilatation and volvulus. And, and what I'm going to talk to you about is whether you can make a case for doing these in dogs that are, no that are normal as opposed to uh, finding something like this in surgery. And this is obviously a necropsy specimen, but we can see that we've got uh, uh, gastric dilatation in the middle here. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that when you are doing an exploratory laparotomy on a patient that, uh, that you suspect a gastric dilatation with volvulus, if you see omentum lying on top of the stomach, um, then that tells us that it is a, a gastric volvulus. And, that is a clockwise gastric volvulus, which occurs in about 90% of patients. If you see dilatation and clinical signs of gastric volvulus, but you don't see any omentum covering the stomach, either it has reversed itself or potentially, um, uh, potentially it's a counterclockwise or an anticlockwise torsion, which occurs only in about 10% of patients. So this is uh, uh, another patient that's had a gastric dilatation and volvulus. This is another necropsy specimen. Um, Remove the omentum over here on the side, and we can see the gastric necrosis um, right here. And so this patient obviously succumbed um, to its gastric dilatation and volvulus. So just looking down um, at our live chat, we have 21 people watching, and um, I'm just seeing if there are any questions that I need to answer. Sound is good. Hello from India. So quite a few uh, from India I'm watching. So that's exciting. Anyway, looking forward to uh, uh, more comments and questions on our live stream. So um, so the, the question that I'm going to answer here in this uh, little seminar is whether we can justify prophylactic gastropexy in a normal dog. And, you know, and what would I do if it were my own dog? So with prophylactic gastropexy, it is a fact that prophylactic gastropexy provides lifetime protection against, against gastric dilatation with volvulus um, in about 95% of patients. So the risk is only about 5% of GDV ash, after gastropexy. And I had a comment, um, and I'll actually go down into my email now because I had a comment from somebody uh, that uh, is a viewer watching from um, or commented on Facebook the fact that in, in her study that um, performing a belt loop gastropexy was more effective than an incisional gastropexy at preventing gastric dilatation and volvulus. And I, I will say that in my review of the veterinary literature, there's no real difference in the incidence of postoperative um, gastric volvulus in dogs that have had an incisional gastropexy compared to those that have had a belt loop gastropexy. There was one type of gastropexy that was done um, historically, which was a gastrocolopexy, where in the stomach was not attached to the body wall at all. It was just attached to the, um, to the colon, and that was ineffective at preventing gastric volvulus. So that's one of the procedures I would definitely not recommend. But amongst the other ones like belt loop gastropexy, circumcostal gastropexy, incisional gastropexy, laparoscopic cystic gastropexy, they're all going to be fairly similar in their effectiveness at preventing a, uh, a GDV. So the prophylactic gastropexy in Melbourne, it's about $3,000 for a referral center gastropexy and probably less than primary care practice. Now, if you combine that with like an ovaria hysterectomy, um, or something like that, where you just have to extend the incision a little bit farther, it's likely that the cost of 
the gastropexy is going to go down even further. Um, just looking down at my comments here, um, and we have a comment, as a Dane breeder, I always advise against it. Hopefully we'll convince you otherwise. Um, and a question about wanting to discuss the risk of torsion of the intestine when, it, when the stomach is unable to flip. Um, and I'm sorry to say that there's no evidence in my, um, uh, in my understanding that if you do a, a gastropexy that you have any higher risk of intestinal torsion. And I, I think there's just absolutely no uh, evidence for that whatsoever. Um, intestinal torsion is usually, usually related to exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in German shepherds. That's the only time I've ever seen intestinal torsions. I've never seen it in a patient that has not had exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So I strongly believe um, that the concern over intestinal torsion because you've pexied the stomach as a risk, I think that there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, so coming down uh, uh, for the discussion here, uh, when you do uh, prophylactic gastropexies, what are the risks associated with that? Um, uh, you can potentially have decreased gastric motility, possibly obstruction of the gastric outflow. If you, um, if you uh, 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 constrict the outflow too much when you do the gastropexy, you can occasionally have incisional complications. And if you do a circumcostal gastropexy, you could potentially have a pneumothorax, but those risks are uncommon. So Gastric dilatation without volvulus occurs in about 5% of dogs after gastropexy and has a mortality rate of about 1%. So these are the statistics that we're looking at. And I'll go back uh, uh, to anesthetic risk is, is about one in a thousand for a prophylactic gastropexy. And, um, and if you do a gastropexy, you give basically lifetime protection against gastric dilatation with volvulus. Um, risk of GDV is about 5% after gastropexy. And, um, and again, to reiterate, gastric dilatation without volvulus also occurs in about 5% of dogs that have had a gastropexy. And because you're not twisting the stomach, um, the risk of mortality is only about 0.1%. Um, there's another question. Does gastropexy affect exteriorization of the stomach if surgery is required for a gastric foreign body in the future? Uh, that's, a, a, that's a good question. Um, because you're tacking the stomach off to the side, and you're making your incision down the midline, it doesn't affect your ability to access the stomach. And usually we don't exteriorize the stomach completely when we're doing a foreign body retrieval. We're just making a gastrotomy, often pulling the, um, the stomach, the, the margins of the gastrotomy out of the abdomen and then just reaching in with an instrument so we don't have to exterior exteriorize the stomach at all. Um, another question, colonic torsions have been reported in large breed dogs. I'm not aware of any association um, of gastropexy aside the fact that many large breed dogs have had a gastropexy, no causative association. So um, that's a really good uh, comment. Um, I And honestly, I've been in referral practice for 30 years. I've been a specialist for 23 years, and I have never seen a colonic torsion other than in a horse. So I, I am not aware of that as being an issue at least not very commonly in, um, in dogs, either with or without a gastropexy. I'm really excited about the number of um, comments that are coming up here um, on, the, uh, on the chat line. And this is exactly the kind of discussion that I would like. Um, so I'll switch back over to my face and uh, hello there. Um, and I'm just reviewing the questions that are coming up here. Um, I had one that went for a scope, but was full of brass and vegetable, vegetable material. We didn't go to surgery, but it would have been a high contamination risk. So I think that that's fair enough. So I will go back to the, um, uh, to my PowerPoint presentation. All right. So what are the costs of not doing a gastropexy? Mortality of untreated GDV is estimated to be 80%. So these are the dogs that, that have a GDV and either are not taken for treatment because nobody's around or that um, uh, people for financial reasons or whatever decide not to treat, 80% mortality. Mortality of treated GDV estimated to be between 15 and 25%. So um, conservatively speaking, 
Um, the cost of treatment of GDV is estimated to be about $8,000, and I certainly have seen them up into the five-digit range, um, ten dollars to $20,000 if they're really, really sick. Um, and also you have a huge amount of emotional distress whether or not the pet survives. So I'm going to take a break for a minute again and have a look at the comments because they're just flying past here. Um, I think... I think another question or another issue that I have seen and associated with gastropexy specifically in Great Danes is that dogs post-surgery tend to have soft, soft stools regardless of diet. Again, I'm not aware of that um, as being an issue. I'd be interested um, to see a study that shows that one way or another. And certainly ELNS, if you are aware of a study that demonstrates that, I'd be really interested to see it. Obviously, this is not uh, the end of the world. Obviously, this is not the end of the world. It's more of a nuisance. And the Great Dane Club of America has noted on this particular side effect before. Um, so that's um, that's very interesting. All right, so I'll go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so uh, again, reviewing these issues, mortality associated with untreated GDV is about 80%. Mortality of treated GDV is estimated to be about 15 to 25%. Um, maybe I've seen, seen some reports that are even as much as 33%. The cost of treatment of GDV is estimated to be about $8,000. And you obviously have a lot of emotional distress whether or not the pet survives. And I'm, um, there's a saying, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I am a surgeon, I like doing surgery, um, but this is a situation that, that I believe I'm making a case for prophylactic gastropexy in predisposed breeds. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. So there was a study that was um, done in a journal called Preventative Veterinary Medicine, where they looked at the benefits of prophylactic gastropexy for dogs at risk of gastric dilatation volvulus. This was done at uh, Purdue University School of Veterinary Medicine, which is a very highly regarded veterinary school in the United States. Um, and basically what they looked at was purely on a monetary uh, basis what are the effects of doing prophylactic gastropexy compared with doing, um, of not doing a prophylactic gastropexy and then comparing that with the risk of, of um, having a GDV. So up here in the upper left-hand side here, if you don't do a prophylactic gastropexy, you have two outcomes. One is GDV, the other is no GDV. Of the ones that have GDV, a proportion are going to die and a proportion are going to survive. And of the ones that survive, you have the risk of recurrence of, of gastric dilatation, not volvulus, gastric dilatation, and the risk of not recurring, and then the cost of each of those possibilities. And then you have the other possibility is no prophylactic gastropexy, no GDV, and then you have no cost. If you do a prophylactic gastropexy, you have a risk of either gastric dilatation or gastric dilatation and volvulus. The risk of gastric dilatation and volvulus in patients that have had a prophylactic gastropexy, as I said before, was about 5%, and a proportion of those are going to die, a proportion of those are going to survive, and you're going to have costs associated with each of those. If you do a practic, uh, prophylactic gastropexy and you have no recurrence of gastric dilatation or uh, uh, incidence of gastric dilatation volvulus, you'll have a cost associated just with the prophylactic gastropexy. And if you have a gastric dilatation without volvulus, some are going to die. Uh, uh, and that's uh, estimated to be about 1%. Some are going to survive approximately 99%. Some of those are going to have recurrent gastric dilatation. That's going to come at a cost, and some are going to have gas, uh, not have gastric dilatation, and that's going to come at a cost. And so they calculated purely on financial terms that in breeds with a lifetime risk of greater than 34%, prophylactic gastropexy was worthwhile in 2003 when the study was published. So basically, what they're saying is that if you have purely on financial terms, if you have a lifetime risk of greater than 34%, prophylactic gastropexy was worthwhile in 2003 when the study was published. Based on prevention of mortality, prophylactic gastropexy was rec recommended in all the breeds that they examined. And um, I'll go back to this study. If you guys wanna take a note of that, um, maybe take a screenshot or take a photo with your phone, if you guys want to pull up that study on your own, um, if you um, can't find that study, you can email me and I can get it for you, um, but you guys can read that um, for yourselves and review the conclusions of that study. Um, so 
just going back down here, um, what is the prevalence of GDV in predisposed um, breeds? I will discuss that in just a minute. As far as gastric malpositioning goes, I've heard of chronic and intermittent vomiting post-op with some resolution. Any comments on specific surgical technique errors leading to issues? So, um, Dylan, that's a great question. Um, I'll go back to my face now. So um, there are ways that you can do a gastropexy that can predispose them to post-operative vomiting. And I think anytime you create a major kink in the antrum or the pylorus of the stomach with your gastropexy, there is a risk that you're going to have a um, uh, uh, recurrent vomiting after surgery. And so the keys with that is what I do is that I lay them on their back and when I'm in surgery, I pull the stomach out or the antrum of the stomach out to where it most comfortably wants to reside against the stomach wall. And that's where I do my gastropexy. There have been studies that have shown that the location of the antrum in the abdomen changes with different breeds. And I don't have the results of that study um, myself, but I think that what they were looking at was the fact that in some breeds of dogs, if you come and go, uh, like attach it to the last rib, like you do with the circumcostal gastropexy or something like that, that you can potentially create a kink in the stomach. And so it is important to do the gastropexy in a position that's going to be anatomic. Um, so I'll go back to me and, uh, sorry, to the PowerPoint and put me back up in the corner. Um, so breed related or breed rated 10 year risk. Um, the highest breed related risk is bloodhounds in one study. And that was 39% with males, 55%. So that means that, um, between 40 and 50% of bloodhounds, sorry, 40% of bloodhounds up to 55% of male bloodhounds are going to, um, have a GDV at some point in their lives. Remembering that untreated GDV has a um, mortality of about 80%. Um, Great Danes are reported to be anywhere between 37 and 53%, with males as high as 61%. Irish wolfhounds are 26%, males um, up to 36%. Standard poodles, 25%, males are 33%. So you can see the trend here that males have generally a higher risk of gastric dilatation volvulus than females. Um, and that bloodhounds, Great Danes, Irish wolfhounds are highly, uh, and uh, standard poodles are highly represented. Um, Akitas, Irish setters, Collies, Weimariners, German shepherds, Newfoundlands, and Rottweilers. Um, if you look down, Newfoundlands and Rottweilers are relatively low risk of gastric dilatation volvulus, although they are higher than the, um, the reference population of all dogs um, combined. So um, there's a question, when you have an active breeding female uh, is doing a prophylactic gastropexy, put them at risk for issues. I'm not aware of any issues related to um, of actively breeding female. Um, I could imagine that maybe doing a cesarean section might be a little bit tricky. Generally, you're going to be farther caudal. Um, uh, you're going to be farther caudal with your incision for your cesarean section than you are for your gastropexy, but that's the only thing that I could imagine being a problem. There's a question here, Dr. Charles, what do you think of use of meloxicam post-op when has been a GDV correction without gastrotomy or splenectomy? So I would avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in any patient that's had um, a GDV for numerous reasons. The first one is that they've been hypotensive often. And so whenever you have hypotension, you have potential for kidney um, uh, toxicity with, um, uh, with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And then the other issue is that you have uh, concerns over uh, gastric um, uh, blood supply and potential for gastric ulceration. And, um, and so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are more likely to be a problem in those dogs as far as causing gastric ulceration. So I would avoid uh, non-steroidals in any dog that's had a GDV. Is there a problem using them in a dog that's had a prophylactic gastropexy? I don't think that that's an issue. There's another question that is, uh, to, uh, has there been a study looking at why males are more prone to GDV than, than females? And it probably relates to the deepness of the chest. And so there is definitely a predisposition when you look at the, the height of the chest compared to the width of the chest, the higher the height to width ratio, the more likely they are to experience a GDV. So 
Um, really good questions. I love this discussion that's going on here. This has been a very animated, um, animated chat, much more so than um, my live stream surgeries. So um, other at-risk breeds uh, that have been reported in the literature include Afghan Hound, Malamute, Bernese Mountain Dog, Boxers, Dobermans, Great Pyrenees, Golden Retrievers, and Labradors. And I can personally say that I have seen GDVs commonly in Bloodhounds, Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, Standard Poodles. I can't remember if I've seen an Akita. Definitely have seen German Shepherds. Um, I don't know that I have seen a Rottweiler. I have seen, I think I said I've seen Irish Setters. Uh, Malamutes, I have seen. Uh, I have seen Dobermans for sure. I've seen Golden Retrievers and I've seen Labrador Retrievers. And this is in my practice, recognizing that I have not worked in an emergency hospital um, in the last 11 years, which means I don't see as many gastric dilatation and volvuluses as um, specialists in in uh, emergency hospitals or uh, general vets working in emergency hospitals. So other risk factors, we've already talked about gender, um, uh, that being males being at higher risk than females, pure breed dogs, dogs that are excitable and anxious, deep chested dogs, as we had discussed previously, a first degree relative of a dog having a GDV. So that's going to be a sibling or a parent or a child. Um, speed of eating has been uh, uh, related as well. And so dogs that kind of bolt um, their food are more likely to be at risk. And interestingly, raising the food bowl increases the risk. And so um, I'm not sure if that's a direct cause and effect where you have people that are concerned about um, yeah, that are concerned about getting a GDV in their pet. And so they they tend to feed them higher because they've heard that that reduces the incidence of GDV. And those dogs are already predisposed. And so that's why um, there's an association between raising the food bowl or if it's actually the fact that the head is up high and elevated when they're eating. Uh, there's some suggestion that splenectomy predisposes them to GDV and whether it's because you have less attachment in the abdomen, which allows more free movement of the stomach around. Um, my tendency is to say that if I have an at-risk at breed and I'm doing a splenectomy, I'm going to do a gastropexy on that dog. In fact, if I have any um, at-risk breed and I'm in the abdomen for any reason, I'm pretty much going to do a gastropexy on that dog. So what's the surgical procedure? Basically, what we're doing is that we're lifting the abdominal wall. We're, we're looking here at the right abdominal wall. So this is the linea alba right here. And then we've got the stomach sitting up against the abdominal wall here. And what we're doing is that we're going to make a, a seromuscular incision in the ant, uh, pylorus or the antrum. And then I'm going to make an incision in the body wall right here. And then I'm just going to suture those two together using a simple continuous suture pattern. Very, very straightforward. Uh, this is a uh, uh, view of one of my own patients. So I've done my seromuscular incision in the stomach here and then done my um, uh, inter internal abdominal oblique incision here on the body wall, and then I'm doing a simple continuous suture pattern. And that is a very, very robust um, incisional gastropexy. I've never seen one break down. I've never heard of one breaking down. So this is what they look like when we're finished. I'm just going to grab a drink of water. Um, and there's another question about Australian Shepherds. I personally have not seen any GDV in Australian Shepherds. I'd be interested to get comments from anybody else who's watching um, as to whether they've seen them um, uh, before. So obviously, if you are doing a GDV surgery, you have to do a gastropexy, and it would be considered malpractice if you did a GDV surgery and did not pexy them at the same time after uh, derotating. Um, question about Charles, which type of collie? I'm talking about um, uh, just a normal either wired hair or smooth hair collie, like the dogs that look like Lassie. Um, there's a question, what if you need to raise the food bowl for animals with megasophagus? There's no question that the megasophagus would take priority in that case. You would definitely raise the food, food bowl um, in order to prevent the uh, regurgitation and aspiration pneumonia. So critical that you raise the foosball, food bowl on those dogs. If it was a, an at-risk breed and, a, and like it was a German shepherd or something like that, and it had megasophagus, 
my tendency would be to say that I would do a gastropexy on those dogs prophylactically, but um, but hard to say. Uh, so somebody made the comment, never seen one in an Aussie, but I'm sure I will. And somebody, uh, Dylan, the comment, probably jumping ahead, but do we have some more evidence to support the use of prophylactic laparoscopic assisted gastropexy? Are there any limitations or contraindications? So Dylan, I am going to discuss laparoscopic a little bit. Um, there's no evidence that laparoscopic works any differently from a conventional incisional gastropexy. And so um, I don't think that um, that doing them laparoscopically is going to have any different statistics postoperatively. Um, the only thing that laparoscopic assisted gastropexy is if you're doing them truly laparoscopically, uh, doing all your suturing intracorporeal corporeally, it's a longer surgery compared to doing it um, either as an open gastropexy or a minimally invasive um, incisional gastropexy. So if you do uh, GDV surgery and you don't perform a gastropexy at the time of surgery, GDV will recur in almost every case. And I believe that this is an act of negligence. So if you're doing GDV surgery and you derotate the stomach, you have to pexy them. There's no question about that. And if you don't pexy them at the time of the GDV surgery and they have a recurrence of GDV, um, that uh, I believe that that the, the client would have a case for negligence. Um, and I have seen that happen in the past. Um, and I think that that's just, um, I think that that's just really a, a bad idea. Um, question, how far can we wait before doing the surgery if a dog is diagnosed to uh, with GDV? Um, and um, hard work to find it as an emergency. So I don't think you can wait at all. If you've got a GDV that comes in and and you've decompressed it, I would take that dog straight to surgery. There's some question as to maybe if you decompress them and pass a stomach tube, that waiting 24 hours is not a bad idea. Problem is that you're going to have to fix that stomach tube in place, um, either through a pharyngostomy tube or an esophagostomy tube or something like that. My tendency is that if I can stabilize the patient, I'm going to take it to surgery straight away. And again, there are other people that believe otherwise, that you should decompress them, pass the stomach tube, turn it into a pharyngostomy tube, so exit the stomach tube through the side of the neck, and then stabilize the patient for 24 hours. Again, if I've got gastric ne necrosis, I'm going to want to get in there and resect that gastric necrosis. So I'm not going to get release of toxins and potentially development of peritonitis. So that is my personal opinion. I've got a, if I've got a GDV, I'm going to stabilize it with fluids, decompress it, and take it straight to surgery on the same day. There's a comment about, I had one case in a dachshund, um, and I have seen it in a dachshund before as well. They are considered to be a predisposed breed. I'm sorry if I didn't include that on my list previously. So this is the laparoscopic gastropexy approach. And what we're doing, all we're, all we're doing with the laparoscope is that we are using um, the scope to view which part of the stomach we want to grab and bring out through the right side of the body wall in order to perform our gastropexy. And we did a prophylactic gastropexy yesterday. We had a German short air pointer that we're doing a TPLO on, and the owners had a sibling of that dog that died of GDV, and so they wanted a gastropexy done. So we didn't even do it laparoscopically. We did the TPLO first and then just made an incision in the body wall, right side of the just caudal to the the ribs and about 10 centimeters lateral to the um, to the midline, and then just reached in, pulled the stomach out through the body wall, made a seromuscular incision, and then just sutured it just like this. So very straightforward surgery. And so um, I and I have done that commonly before I started doing them laparoscopically, that that you can just make that incision. And I'll stand up here to show you what I'm talking about. So if this is the midline here. You make an incision about that big and you do a grid approach into the abdomen, reach in, grab onto the antrum, pull it out through the body wall, and then suture, do the seromuscular incision and suture it to the body wall. All right, next slide. So uh, we're looking here, uh, ribs A and B, um, that's the 13th, uh, probably, actually the 13th is probably back here. It's probably more like the, the 11th and 10th ribs here. We're making an oblique incision in the body wall. You can either make it oblique or you can make it linear. The reason why this one is oblique is so that it's a little bit easier to grid through the abdominal musculature. 
um, to get down to the stomach. So here's our grid approach. Um, so that's external abdominal oblique, internal abdominal oblique, and then rectus abdominis muscle here. Um, and so we are um, gridding all the way down through the abdomen and then, um, and then grabbing onto the stomach and pulling it out, seromuscular incision and suturing it. So this is the stomach here that we've pulled out through our grid incision, putting two tacking sutures on either end, perform our, our seromuscular incision in the stomach, and then suture it, a simple continuous suture pattern all the way around, making sure that you're suturing to the internal or the rectus muscle rather than to either the internal or external abdominal obliques. Um, and there's a great comment here. I know this session is mainly focusing on dogs, but a fun fact is that guinea pigs do get GDV as well. That's something I did not know. Um, so basically, prophylactic gastropexy, in, according to the literature, is recommended in all bloodhounds, Great Danes, Weimaraners, Irish Wolfhounds, Akitas, Standard Poodles, and other at-risk dogs or at-risk breeds. So that's the conclusion of the um, uh, of all of my discussion is that if I had a dog of any one of these breeds, I would do a prophylactic gastropexy. I have always had Labradors and I have done gastropexies on all of my Labradors as well. So I believe that it's worthwhile. I'm a vet. I don't pay for anything at my practice. I'm not going to pay if we've got a GDV. I'm not going to pay if I don't have a GDV and I'm doing a prophylactic gastropexy. And I have done them in my own dogs. And so in my and Labradors are not the highest risk breeds, but I just believe that I would rather avoid that life, you know, ca uh, catastrophic, um, life threatening event. Um, and so I'm going to do a gastropexy. Josh has commented, What about Bernese Mountain Dogs? Um, let me go back to my previous slide where I listed the breeds. Um, they are at risk, um, the risk is. Uh, lower than some other breeds of dogs. But again, if I had a Bernese Mountain Dog, large, deep-chested dog, I'm going to do a, a prophylactic gastropexy, particularly if I'm going into the abdomen for any other reason. So in answer to your question, Josh, Bernese Mountain Dog, I probably would do it. Um, and anytime um, you have a, 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 a dog that's of an at-risk breed and it's male, it's anxious, it's a first degree relative of a dog with a history of GDV. So any one of these four parameters, I would do a prophylactic gastropexy, and then I would do it in every exploratory laparotomy that I did in an at-risk breed. So if I was uh, doing uh, like a spay in an at-risk breed, I would do a prophylactic gastropexy. If I was doing a splenectomy in an at-risk breed, I would do a gastropexy. If I was going in to take liver biopsies in a Great Dane, for any other reason, I'm going to do a gastropexy. Um, and, and, um, that's, look, that's the way I feel about it. So, um, this is just a quick little video here of us doing, Kinson, let me just see examples. here. So we, um, have started doing them purely laparoscopically, um, using a, uh, robotic functionality. Um, and what we're doing here is we've pulled a needle through the abdominal wall and I'm pulling the stomach uh, putting the needle in through the stomach and I'm going to tack the stomach up to the body wall with a thing, single suture. And then I'm going to use uh, a Flexdex uh, laparoscopic um, uh, laparoscopic uh, robotic um, suture device. And I'm going to use that to perform my incisional gastropexy. Um, there's a comment here. Um, so next topic, I've seen quite a bit of debate on prophylactic anal sacculectomy. Um, I, I don't believe in prophylactic anal sacculectomy if you're not having clinical signs. I guess the, what you're suggesting, Dylan, is in dogs that might get anal sac adenocarcinomas, and I don't think that that's a serious enough tumor to warrant doing a prophylactic um, anal sacculectomy. So looking up here on our, on our slide, you can see that I've done a muscular incision in my internal abdomen, oh, sorry, my rectus abdominis muscle here, and then I'm making a similar incision in the stomach on the antrum. If you look down here on the right-hand side, you can see what we're doing, manipulating the scope here and our laparoscopic instruments here. So here we go with the electric cautery, and I'm making a um, uh, seromuscular incision in the stomach wall, 
there so that we will get a really good adhesion between the stomach and the body wall. Um, and note that when I'm finished with the gastropexy part of the lecture, I am going to um, uh, have a discussion about intestinal surgery and intestinal dehiscence associated with resection and anastomosis. So here's my ro uh, little robot. Um, here, so I'm grabbing the suture and pulling it into the abdomen, and then grabbing it with a Maryland dissector, and then I'm just going to grab the suture with the robot. Um, this was the first one I had done, and so my skill level was um, moderate, <laughs> to say the least, and uh, I am working on um, uh, on improving that skill. And we've done an, uh, about a half dozen of them now. And so the procedure is much quicker and much more elegant. So I've taken a bite of the body wall here, and then I'm using my little robot to grab onto the stomach. Um, so this procedure is done completely laparoscopically. So they're only the, the laparoscopic um, port incisions and the camera incision and no other incisions are performed. So just reaching in there. And you can see the nice thing about this surgical robot is that we've got articulation of the wrist there so that I can um, uh, point the needle in any direction I want as opposed to conventional laparoscopic needle drivers that, um, uh, that you can only work perpendicular to the shaft. So I'll just move this along a little bit here, tying or not. Um, so just cut my suture tying or not there, uh, cutting out my tag, and then this is just a view of the inside of the surgery suite. Um, we've actually advanced beyond, um, uh, beyond the method that we used here. We've got a 3D laparoscope now, and so that makes the procedure even faster. There's a question here. Are you still using normal monofilament suture versus barb suture? So I'm using normal monofilament. And the reason I'm using monofilament is that barb suture I find very um, fiddly in the abdomen. And the barb suture that I purchased was um, very stiff. And so I found that I just got a bird's nest inside the abdomen. And so my tendency is just to go with mono monofilament. The benefit of a barb suture is that you don't have to tie knots at either end. Um, and when you're using the Flexdex, um, tying knots is not a problem anyway. So um, that's that's my prefer preference. I do know that people are using barb suture um, for these procedures. So um, any questions about uh, prophylactic gastropexies before we move on to intestinal surgery and dehiscence? Um, so nothing coming up yet. Um, and uh, I'm also interested in potentially doing a, a live stream lecture on uh, early desexing, and that's a very heated discussion. You know, what are the benefits and negatives of early desexing? And there is some evidence, sorry, that early desexing predisposes female dogs to increased incontinence, which I believe is probably the case, and also potentially increased risk of mast cell tumors and lymphoma and osteosarcoma. So you balance that against the um, decreased risk of mammary cancer in female dogs. So um, that is that is a live stream that I would like to cover at some point in the near future. Um, so in GP, there's a question here. In GP practice, when not going for XLAP otherwise, do you suggest we do linear incision or flank incision? Um, I personally would do the flank incision. It's not really flank. It's paramedian incision because your incision is much, much shorter. So when you're doing a paramedian incision, it's only about five centimeters long, whereas when you're doing an inc a linear incision, you have to make an incision probably 15 to 20 centimeters long. So your risk is going to be, or risk of complications is higher uh, when you do an, uh, a linear incision than when you do, when you do the uh, paramedian incision. So good question, Melissa. Thanks for asking it. So what do we see here? On the slide, we've got a dog that's got peritonitis with gross contamination of the abdomen. Um, uh, full disclosure, if you look at the size of the hand there, uh, this is a horse, um, not one of my patients because I couldn't find a picture of, um, 
uh, I couldn't find a picture of peritonitis uh, easily in my slide set. Melissa comments, perfect. We will give that a go. Go great for male dog desexing option, Dan. That is exactly right, Melissa. I believe that wholeheartedly. I'm just making that little five centimeter paramedian incision, uh, gritting down through the abdominal wall, reaching in, grabbing onto the antrum or the pyloric antrum, pulling it out through the body wall, um, making a seromuscular incision, and then just suturing that internally. So um, intestinal or peritonitis is obviously catastrophic, whether it's a horse or a cat or a dog. Um, and what can we do to avoid it? And what, what do we do when it happens? So um, what we're talking about here is an intestinal resection and anastomosis. And a um, couple of comments here, and I will discuss my technique uh, in much more detail later on. But one thing that's really important, in my opinion, is to use stay sutures. So anytime I'm suturing uh, uh, any kind of lumen, so whether it's a stomach or it's a, an intestine or a urinary bladder, I always like to have stay sutures. And what that does is it allows me to number one, position my tricky suture, which is right here at the mesenteric border, and number two, to put some tension on the suture line so that when I suture it, um, I get much more accurate apposition of the layers and I get more accurate placement of my sutures. You can see I've got doyen intestinal forceps here. Make sure that we're using doyens and not carmalts um, because you can get a really severe crushing injury of the intestine when you use carmalts as opposed to a, a non-traumatic um, intestinal forcep. The other thing you can see here is that I've put laparotomy sponges um, around the um, intestinal resection and anastomosis, and that's to prevent leakage. And I've got a rent here in the mesentery, and I want to make sure that I'm going to close that mesentery um, to prevent um, entrapment and strangulation of an intestinal loop. So I'll get into that in more detail later on. So what are postoperative risks, risks for dehiscence with intestinal surgery? Well, the first one, uh, uh, the risk is about 12%. So anytime you do an intestinal resection and anastomosis, the risk is 12, about 12% that you're going to have leakage. And so I want to make sure, and just um, by comment in the chat line, how many of you warn owners that when you do an intestinal resection and anastomosis, that there's a 10 to 15% chance that you're going to have leakage postoperatively? I know I do. I'm a good surgeon. I do you know, every technique possible in order to avoid dehiscence. And I still warn every owner when I'm doing a resection and anastomosis that there's a risk of dehiscence postoperatively. So um, just uh, interested in your, your comments. So we've got UCLA climbing commenting that they always warn. Really, really good idea. So when you're doing intestinal surgery, I don't care what kind it is, warn the owners that there's a risk of leakage. When you're doing full thickness intestinal biopsies, that's still 5% risk of leakage. So... Um, 5% of dogs that have intestinal biopsies are going to have leakage, and, and you have to make sure that you warn your owners about that. And there are things that you can do to reduce the risk, but um, definitely a possibility. So when I do um, a gastrotomy for a foreign body, I don't usually warn about leakage because the risk is very low. Um, you've got two layers to close there. It's a fairly relatively sterile environment because of the stomach acid, and so I think the risk is lower. Um, but with intestinal surgery, definitely um, risk. And I've got a comment here from Dylan. Always warn people, regardless of how well it looked, comes together. Um, and Dylan, you're jumping ahead again regarding cirrhosal and omental patches. I definitely believe in them, but I'll talk to, the, uh, to you guys about the technique that I use in just a couple of minutes. So what are risks? So poor nutrition um, and hypoproteinemia is definitely a risk. Um, for dehiscence after surgery. So if you're doing an intestinal resection and anastomosis in a dog that had an intestinal adenocarcinoma, it's hypoproteinemic, it's poor uh, uh, has poor nutritional state, there's a high risk that that dog's going to leak. Um, comment, what about making a splenectomy in a young dog? I had a case four-month-old bloodhound with GDV. Are there any blood changes in blood morphology? So I'm not sure, uh, taught us exactly what the question is here. Um, so if, um, I, so are you saying prophylactic splenectomy in a young dog with a GDV? Uh, I, I probably would not prophylactically do a splenectomy in a dog that had a GDV. Um, but I would do a, 
prophylactic gastropexy in the dog that had a splenectomy. Um, and then blood changes in blood morphology. I assume that you're talking about um, with, um, I'm not sure if it's with splenic tumors or with gastric dilatation and volvulus, but you can definitely have red blood cell changes in either of those situations. Um, so the other big risk factor for post-operative dehiscence is if you were operating for peritonitis in the first place. So hypoperitonemic patient operating on a patient with peritonitis to start with. So if you're going into an abdomen in a dog that has peritonitis, there's about a 75% chance that that is going to leak again after surgery. So that's a very, very high risk. So you're doing surgery in a dog that had peritonitis for a ruptured foreign body or something like that, and then you go in and do a resection anastomosis, there's a 75% chance that that dog's gonna leak again after surgery. So that's a very, very high rate. Um, if you're doing surgery for a foreign body or a tumor, there's a higher risk of, of dehiscence after surgery. If the patient becomes hyper, hypotensive during surgery, there's a higher risk of dehiscence after surgery. If you're giving immunosuppressive drugs like chemotherapeutic agents or high-dose steroids, there's a higher risk of, um, of dehiscence after surgery. If you don't trim out all of the necrotic tissue, there's a higher risk. If you use chromic cat gut, and I can't imagine anybody in this day and age would use chromic cat gut for an intestinal surgery, um, but that is associated with higher risk, um, higher risk of dehiscence. So just to review, hypoalbuminemia, pre-existing peritonitis, surgery because of a foreign body or tumor, hypotension during surgery, immunosuppressive medications like chemotherapeutic agents or um, high-dose steroids, incomplete removal of necrotic tissue, and use of gut suture. So um, uh, those seven things, if you want to take a photo of this with the, of the screen with your phone right now, um, wouldn't be a bad idea just so that you can remember these if you have any of these uh, risk factors in a patient that you're doing intestinal surgery. All right, so um, there was a study where they looked at 35 dogs that had dehiscence following intestinal resection and anastomosis, and they specifically were looking for risk factors um, and predictors of dehiscence postoperatively. So they were looking at ways that they could predict dehiscence after surgery. And these are the patients that are kind of, um, uh, you know, you're two days out from surgery, they're still not eating, maybe a little bit of abdominal pain. How do you decide whether to go back in surgically? Um, you know, how can you predict the likelihood of dehiscence? And so looking at things like the difference between the abdominal fluid and serum with respect to glucose and lactate. So if your uh, glucose in your serum is higher then the abdomen, abdominal fluid, that's a sign of um, potential dehiscence. And the reason why that happens is because the bacteria in the abdomen are eating up that glucose. And so the glucose in the abdominal fluid is going to be lower. And then lactate is going to be higher in the abdominal fluid than it is in the serum. We're also going to use cytology. And then culture can be helpful, although unfortunately culture can take um, days to come back. And so um, that probably isn't going to be your best bet when trying to predict dehiscence. So difference between abdominal fluid and serum with respect to glucose and lactate, looking at abdominal fluid cytology and then culture. If you suspect dehiscence, reoperate immediately. So my residents are taught that if, you know, if it's six o'clock at night and you think maybe there's a, a dehiscence because you've got more abdominal fluid or they're painful or whatever, just cut them open and have a look. You're going to sleep much better that night. So the first minute, first hour that you think you might have a dehiscence, get back in there and have a look. You're much better off doing it in um, immediate, you know, in the day after surgery rather than waiting four days. And then you're sure you've got a dehiscence because the belly is full of pus. The prognosis is going to be much, much worse. So the earlier you get in there and resolve the dehiscence, the better off you're going to be and the better the prognosis is going to be. Um, comment about looking forward to you uploading this as I missed a large part of it. So Jamshid, it will already, like as soon as the video is, or the webinar is finished, it's going to be uploaded. So you don't even need to wait for me to upload it. Um, so when do you feed? 
Um, this is a question for everybody, a survey question, which I should have stated, uh, uh, stated the question more clearly on the presentation. When do you feed? Do you feed immediately after surgery? Do you wait 24 hours? Do you wait seven days? The answer to that question is immediately. So we've got UCA LA climbing, early enteral free feeding is exactly right. So we want to feed them as soon as they're awake. The only time that I would not feed them um, by mouth as soon as they're awake would be if they are vomiting. And if they're still vomiting, we're going to want to try to find another way to get nutrition in there. But if you feed them immediately, and I mean literally, like if I finish surgery at four o'clock and the dog's awake at seven o'clock at night, I'm going to feed it straight away. That's going to accelerate healing. It's been shown to increase our bursting strength, decrease postoperative ileus, and is associated with a shorter hospital stay. Um, so another question from Melissa, or a comment from Melissa, we attempt to feed when awake enough, which is exactly right. So um, the justification that people make for delaying feeding is that you're afraid that it's going to leak or something like that. The leakage, the peak leakage risk is at about four days, and it only returns to the immediate post-operative status at about seven days out. So unless you're going to fast them for seven days, there's, it makes no sense to fast them for 24 hours. Does that make sense to everybody? So the bursting strength is lowest at four days and then returns to post-operative status at about seven days. And so if you're not going to fast them for seven days, there's no reason to fast them for 24 hours. And again, if you feed them immediately, that's going to accelerate your healing increase bursting strength, decrease ileus, and shorter hospital stay. I had a couple of comments. I've started giving, uh, giving in, uh, insight at recovery to help with this. So um, you said LA climbing, that's a really good comment. That's exactly what we want to do is we want to feed them as soon as they're awake. Um, pneumoperitoneum. Um, so there was a study that looked at cases of pneumoperitoneum um, and what that means is that you take an x-ray for whatever reason, suspecting abdominal pain, whatever, and you see free air in the abdomen. It sounds obvious, but the risk or the, the likelihood that that patient is going to survive without surgery is 7%. So all of those patients are going to die, whereas the survival with surgery is about 58%. So if you ever take an abdominal x-ray and it's a patient that you have not been in previously within the past month, um, you've got to explore that patient straight away. And so note that you're going to have free air in the abdomen for several days to weeks after an abdominal exploratory. So that's not the patient that we're talking about. But in patients that have not had an uh, abdominal surgery, if they've got free air in the abdomen, um, you've got to go straight into surgery. Uh, so I've got a video here of how I like to do intestinal biopsies and with a mentalization. And so I'll just expand that here. So here you can see um, my um, stay sutures on either side. So when I'm doing intestinal biopsies, I've got stay sutures, and that's going to help keep tension on the tissue and make it a lot easier to, um, to take our biopsy. Take a nice full thickness biopsy. And then we're going to close that generally in a simple continuous suture pattern. <clears throat> so you want to go full thickness and see how I've avoided the mucosa on my first bite. Now I've gone through the mucosa and I'm going to go through and go through the mucosa on the other side. Just a quick survey question. What is the holding layer of the small intestine going from the serosa to the muscularis to the submucosa to the mucosa? Anybody know what the holding layer for the small intestine is. I know most people will know this, but um, so we've got one correct answer from um, UCL Climbing, another correct answer from Jamshade Cooper. Um, so um, that's exactly right. So submucosa is the holding layer. The only way to make sure that you're getting the holding layer, the submucosa, is to um, grab the mucosa as well, because you can't separate the mucosa from the submucosa in, in a dog. And now here we're bringing omentum up. And every time I do an intestinal biopsy, I know it sounds like overkill. Every time I do an intestinal biopsy, 
I'm going to do an omental patch. So see how I'm just going around and taking bites around the outside of my incision and just tacking the omentum down over the incision. Okay, and that's going to significantly reduce the risk of, of dehiscence. And I've been doing a lot of intestinal surgery. I haven't had a leakage to my knowledge in about 10 years. And I omentalize every time, every time I go into an intestine, whether it's for a biopsy or a resection in anastomosis, I'm going to do a, a, an omentopexy. So basically, that's just taking a, a little branch of, of, um, of omentum, and I'm going to tack it down to the um, to the incision. So this is just a slide that I got um, uh, off the internet, and there are a couple of comments here. The first one is, you can see that we've got stay sutures here on, on image A. We've got stay sutures on either side. Some people put them at like 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Some people put them at 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. I used to do three stay sutures, but now I do two. I find that it works just as well. Now, this is the scary picture right here. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but you can do, um, you can use skin staples to staple the intestine, and it's been shown to be as effective as a suture technique. Um, I have never done it. I just don't have the guts to do it, but I know some really good surgeons that use routinely skin staples instead of sutures to perform intestinal resection and anastomosis. Uh, just a, <clears throat> a show of hands um, or comments on the chat line. How many of you have done um, stapled, skin stapled intestinal uh, resection and anastomosis? I want to see if anybody's brave enough. I'm just not brave enough to do it. I know that it's very quick, but um, I, you know, I find my sutured anastomosis is do very well. And the risk is so high that if, um, you know, if, if you get dehiscence that I'm just not, I'm not game to do it. So we've got a never, got a scares me from UCLA climbing, a never from Melissa. Um, I bet that that's going to be the consistent answer. Although again, I know great surgeons, board certified specialist surgeons that are happy to use skin staples. All right, so this is uh, back when I was doing interrupted suture patterns for my intestinal resection and astomosis. Now I am happy doing um, uh, simple continuous. I've got a comment from Jamshid. We'll look out for a paper on it. And from Dylan, I've seen it, but I have heard that there is decreased lumen size in one patient that got a linear foreign body down the road. So, um, and, and, and not sure that the decreased lumen size would be clinically relevant down the road because I think the intestine can adapt and stretch. But again, I'm just not, I'm not brave enough to do it. So this is my procedure now where I've got um, my doyen intestinal forceps here and here, and I've got stay sutures on either side. So I'm doing, um, actually in this patient, this was back when I was doing three. So I've got one at 12 o'clock, one at eight o'clock and one at four o'clock. Again, I'm happy to do just 12 and six o'clock now um, with my stay sutures. So just suturing a little bit further along. Um, now, any idea what's going on here? Any comments on what, any guesses about what we're doing here? So this patient had a um, dehiscence of an intestinal surgery done somewhere else, and there was really severe peritonitis in this abdomen. And so because I didn't want this intestine sitting in a bath of pus while it's trying to heal, I did an exteriorized um, intestinal uh, resection and anastomosis. So what we've done is we've closed the linea and we've pulled the intestine out into a sub-Q pocket. And what that does is, number one, you can monitor the healing because you can check it every day. So we didn't close the, ab the skin over the top of it. We had it packed with lap sponges. Number two, the abdomen or the intestine is not sitting in a bath of pus while it's trying to heal. Um, and number three, if it were to leak, it's going to leak into a sub-Q pouch instead of inside the abdomen where it's going to be catastrophic. So this is something that was done originally in, um, in humans that had war injuries to um, the 
uh, intestinal organs like uh, or um, intestine and colon. And so these were in humans and they created these sub-Q pouches um, so that the intestine could heal and they could monitor it for healing um, and found that the survival was quite a bit higher. And so if I have a situation where I've got a really, really bad peritonitis, I'm going to lavage the abdomen and then pull the intestinal resection out into a sub-Q pouch, um, close the linea underneath it, and then when I'm comfortable that the intestine has healed adequately, so four or five days down the road, and I'm also comfortable that the cytology of the abdomen is improving so that we no longer have peritonitis, I'll do what's called a drop procedure, where we drop that back into the abdomen. And that, um, that uh, worked really well on this patient. And um, James Simcock, my business partner, wrote this up. It's a case report that was published probably in about 2009, maybe 2010 um, in JAVMA. Um, so really cool procedure. Um, well, I've only done it a couple of times and only in cases when we had really severe peritonitis inside the abdomen. Obviously peritonitis is inside the abdomen, but yeah, you know what I mean. So um, this is another case that had peritonitis that developed after surgery and I've gone in and redone the resection in anastomosis and this is just the inside of the lumen so you can see um, what one of those looks like um, after surgery. So that's you know nicely placed sutures. And the point here that I wanted to make is that you want to make your simple continuous sutures really evenly spaced and close together. All right, so supplementary techniques, um, as I think Dylan had asked about before. Was that you, Dylan? Um, serosal mental patches, yeah. So mental patches, serosal passage, spatch, patches and then the externalized anastomosis, as I had uh, mentioned previously. So omentum, um, you can just wrap it around the, the resection anastomosis, or you can suture it down. Usually, if I'm going to wrap it around, I am going to make some uh, a few little suture bites to hold it in place. And omentum has been shown to improve lymphatic drainage, provide blood supplied, accelerated healing or accelerates healing and seals leakage if it occurs. And so that can be the difference between um, uh, uh, leakage postoperatively and not leakage. So whenever whenever I do any kind of intestinal surgery, I do an omental patch. And this is an example of a serosal patch. So what you're doing here is that when you have a diseased intestine internal, you know, in, uh, that you're concerned about postoperative leakage, you just create a little cuff with other loops of bowel and suture them together. So you're creating almost like a beer co cozy or a beer stubby holder um, surrounding, um, surrounding the area of concern. And that's going to really markedly reduce the risk of leakage afterward. So that's all I have for today. And I'm, I'm gonna stay on the line for a little while. If you guys um, have had enough, you can log out if you have any more questions for me, I'll stick around for about five minutes. I'm happy to discuss anything from intestinal surgery to gastric dilatation volvulus all the way through to, you know, tumor surgery, anything that you're interested in. And I will try to do these live webinars more in the future. Um, switch back over to my face. So um, here's your chance. Um, just to thank you, um, and you're very welcome, Melissa. I'm glad you could watch, and I know I've seen your your name before previously on live streams and stuff. So I'm glad that uh, that you were able to attend this. Um, thank you from White Oaks. Great chat from Dylan. Uh, that's no problem. Uh, great pleasure, and um, from Sigwi. Um, so questions about suture size recommendation for gastropexy from MobiVet. So. I would use a probably a 3.0 PDS or a 2.0 PDS in a large breed dog um, for the gastropexy. When I'm doing intestinal resection and astomosis, I'm going to use 3.0 in a large dog and 4.0 in a small dog. Um, and there's no problem with using absorbable suture in an incisional gastropexy because that's going to heal very, very quickly. Um, so PDS is great because it's going to provide tensile strength for four to eight weeks after the surgery, but you could even use something like Dexon or Maxon or something like that. I like monofilament because 
with multi-filament braided, I'm concerned that if now I inadvertently enter the lumen of the stomach, that you could potentially wick bacteria out. Um, question from uh, Sonura. In GDVs, do you prefer, prefer to remove gastric content via or gastric tube or gastrotomy? That's a good question. Um, I would. I don't like to do a gastrotomy if I can avoid it in GDVs. I'm going to try to empty the contents using the feeding tube. And the fact is that once you derotate them, um, they will start passing the food down. Um, but look, um, ideally would be to have the stomach empty. Comment from Jamshid, recently taught by Dr. Bonnie Campbell that on mentalization, there are new blood vessels that grow down to the site in seven hours. So that's fantastic. I wasn't aware of that, Jamshid. Thank you for that comment. Um, I have even more uh, ammunition or evidence to, um, to support um, uh, the use of our mental patches. So comment from Sigwe in Perth, um, currently in uni, so always missed the live stream. Glad you were able to make it this time. Um, any other comments or questions about anything? Otherwise, I'm going to have to resort to dad jokes, um, and we know how those can turn out. So uh, highly suggest you come up with some other questions or um, things could get ugly. Uh, could you do a webinar about TPLOs? Um, and that's from Tadas or Tadas. Um, yes, I can do a webinar about TPLOs. We do have several videos on our YouTube channel um, that are either live streams on TPLOs or there's one that's a cartoon that James did on the principles behind TPLO, but I'm happy to do a discussion on them as well. Um, any other questions or comments? So if... Uh, you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel and make sure you turn on notifications. Um, question about GIA staple anastomosis. Uh, anastomosis are shown to be beneficial for resection anastomosis in septic abdomens. Look, that's a good comment and a good question. Um, GIA staple anastomosis, I've had problems with them. Um, sometimes I don't know if I'm asking too much of the GIA and I'm stapling tissue that's too thick. I'm, I'm always reluctant um, to use GIA staple anastomosis. I know that they do them in people. My tendency is to hand suture them. Um, I'm just more, um, uh, more comfortable with that. Um, thoughts on how to convince puppy owners to do prophylactic GDV at desexing. So um, basically, um, Melissa, what I would say is um, if I had an at-risk breed, I mean, you can just tell them, look, the risks of your dog getting a GDV are 10% or 20%, 30%, 40%, whatever it is, and saying that we can virtually eliminate that risk by doing a prophylactic gastropexy, um, and you have to assess whatever you know financial cost there is to that. But if they're already being anesthetized, I just don't see any reason why you wouldn't do it. Um, in, you know, you've got a five centimeter incision uh, if you're if it's a male dog. You've got a slightly longer incision if it's a female dog. But um, the risk you can virtually eliminate the lifetime risk of GDV in those patients. Um, live stream on urinary surgery. I'm sure that we'd be happy. Uh, we can do that. I just um, yep, yeah, very happy to do that. Good suggestion. Um, hard and fast rules for foreign body cases that you are questioning whether to do a resection anastomosis or not. So um, you say you're questioning whether you're going to do an enterotomy or an RNA. Um, my feeling is that I'm going to leave as much intestine in as possible. And my feeling, again, is that if uh, you do an enterotomy, you're less likely to have dehiscence than if you do a resection anastomosis. And so if I can do an enterotomy, and the tissue is healthy, <clears throat> I'd much prefer to do that than an RNA. I'm only going to do an RNA if um, there's evidence of necrosis or if like sometimes you get partial thickness, the um, splitting of the serosa due to the foreign body. And in those cases, I'm more likely to do um, an RNA. Uh, another question from White Oaks Animal Hospital. How much time can we wait for a foreign body to pass before exploration? If I have clinical signs due to the foreign body, so if I've got a dog that comes in for vomiting um, and I do an abdominal radiograph and there is an obstructive pattern, I'm going to take that dog straight to surgery. And I don't believe that we should wait on that at all. If I have a dog that is um, 
not vomiting and it's just having abdominal radiographs for some other reason and I see a foreign body and there's no evidence of a obstructive pattern, I'm happy to wait on that. But if I have vomiting and I have an obstructive pattern and or I have an obstructive pattern, I'm going into surgery on that patient. Um, question. In intestinal anastomosis, I struggle with mild incision site eversion with simple continuous suture pattern. Have you known that to cause any problems? So that's a really good question. Um, eversion is not a big issue. If you have some aversion of the mucosa, you can trim that out. I happen to be a trimmer. Some people are not. I just find it easier to oppose the two sides by trimming the um, everted mucosa. Um, and so that's the way that I deal with it. There is some evidence to suggest that by um, doing a direct appositional pattern, so when you're like this, instead of with mucosa averting like this, that you get more rapid healing. I don't know that there's evidence clinically that it makes a difference. Um, question, how often do you put in feeding tubes for GDV or intestinal surgery? Really good question. Um, if I have a patient that is not eating prior to surgery, um, I'm going to put in a feeding tube and I'm going to use as much of the normal gastrointestinal tract as I can. That means that if the patient is not vomiting, I'm just going to put in an esophagostomy tube. Um, if the patient is vomiting, then we're going to have to do a J junostomy tube. Um, if we have a lot of dilation of the stomach and I'm worried about um, ileus postoperatively with a GDV, I'll put in a gastrostomy tube. Um, in order to empty out fluid and air that may accumulate within the stomach after surgery. There's another GDV technique, which is a tube gastropexy, which is where you put in a mushroom tip feeding tube in the antrum or pylorus and use that to form a pexy to the body wall. The benefit of that is that you can empty the stomach afterward and you can also um, enterally feed them. Um, the downside is that unless you're doing a purse string suture between the stomach and the body wall, if that tube gets prematurely pulled out, you're going to have peritonitis and leakage from that site. So, um, but that is a, that is a really good um, comment, Tadas. So, any other questions or comments before I wrap up the live stream? Just watching my phone here to see if anything comes up. All right. Well, with that. We're going to go ahead and end the live stream. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, if you have any questions or comments afterward, you can put them in the comments after the video, and I try to get to them uh, probably every couple of days. Um, if you haven't already done so, please make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications. So thanks again for watching, and we will terminate the live stream. All right. Where am I? Um...